All right, there we go. So today is a good day because we're going to be talking about the derivative, but we are going to finally put away the limit definition of the derivative and we're going to get some shortcuts. All right, things that are allow us to take derivatives, find derivatives of functions, much easier than we have had to deal with so far, right? So the notes for today, let me just bring these up. Here we go. So these are the notes. I'm not going to um, read through all these, but just so you know, we're, we're covering 2.3 basic differentiation formulas. And so this just says, yeah, now we're going to establish some shortcuts. And here we go. So I'm going to begin by reminding you the main idea of last class, which was if we start with some function f, right, we do this thing to it called taking the derivative, so differentiation. And we get this <coughs> new function, right? A new function. So start with some function. We do this thing called differentiation or taking the derivative and it creates a new function for us, right? And we've had to do the limit to do that. Last class, we redefined what the derivative was. We said f prime of x, right? We used x instead of a. We said this is limit, h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And that's the definition that, that we now have for the derivative, right? <clears throat> and so if I, I give you a function, for example, if I give you um, let f of x be, let's go with 4x cubed minus 8x squared plus 3x minus 3. If I gave you that function and I asked you right now to find the derivative, what you would have to do would suck, okay? Because you would have to do this. You would have to go, all right, this is the limit as h goes to zero. And then the first thing you're going to do <clears throat> is you're going to plug x plus h into this, right? You replace all the x's with x plus h. So that would look like this. 4 times x plus h cubed minus 8 times x plus h squared. Uh, where are we? Plus 3 times x plus h and then minus 3. So that right there, everything you see here is just this, right? And then you have to subtract from that f of x, right, which would be in parentheses because that negative is going to distribute the entire function 4x cubed minus 8x squared plus 3x minus 3, and then the whole thing <coughs> divided by h. And then we would be in for some algebra at this point, right? We would have to do a lot of work here. We'd have to expand this, multiply 4 through, expand that, multiply negative 8 through, distribute the 3 through, distribute the negative through, put things there, see what cancels, right? See if an h goes away, right? That's what we would do. The idea of today is that we don't want to have to do this anymore, right? We want a shorter way. So I'm going to have to give you the basic differentiation rules, right? And, and there's a few of them. So let's start with the very first one, all right? So I'm going to just put here like this, right? We're not happy about that. We don't want to do that. But we, wanted, we want a way to do it. So the first rule, so this is basic differentiation rules. And the first one. All right, now the first one that I'm going to give you, I want us to do it visually first. Okay, I want us to see if we can figure out this rule without having to actually use 
the definition of the derivative. Let's just see if we visually can make, make sense out of this. So um, suppose f of x is a constant function. So when I say c here, c is any constant. When I say constant, I mean a number, right? So let's just say you've got a function and it's just a number. All right, well, let's do a specific example. What about f of x equals 4? What would that look like graphically? If I told you to graph that function, what would it look like? Straight, straight line, what do you mean? Like I agree it's straight, but OK. It's horizontal, right? It's a horizontal line. This, if you graph it, would be a horizontal line. Let me graph it. It would be up here like this. It would pass through 4, right? And that would be our graph f. Agreed? What's the slope of the tangent line at any point on that graph? Zero, right? So do you agree that just from the picture, the derivative of this function, bless you, should be zero? Yes. Yeah? Would that hold for any constant function? Yes, sir. Yeah, because any constant function is going to be a horizontal line. And all horizontal lines have a slope of zero. So does it make sense to you that the derivative of a constant should always be zero? Yes? yes? That's the first rule of differentiation. The derivative of all constants is zero. So here's the actual rule, okay? So the rule for number one, it's called the constant rule. Watch the way I write it, okay? Because it's gonna look a little weird. I'm gonna write it in, in two ways. If I ask you to take the derivative, now when I put d over dx, remember the different notations we had? I told you there's all these different notations for derivatives. This right here is a notation for me saying, hey, I want, to take the I want you to take derivative of something. And I want you to treat x like it's the variable. So in the expression, if you see an x, that's what the variable is. All right? So the way you say this uh, verbally is you say you're taking the derivative with respect to x. OK, I'm going to write that down. This means derivative <coughs> with respect to X. All the, the with respect to X just means, hey everyone, X is the variable in the problem. All right? Later on in this class, we're going to see that we're going to be working with things that have multiple variables, and we have to be very specific about which, wh what are we considering the variable to be. All right? So this tells us we're going to take derivative with respect to X, and what are we taking derivative of? I'm going to put that right here. What is it that I'm differentiating? A constant, right? And when I do that, my answer is always zero. That's the rule. Does that notation make sense? Yes? Now, another notation I could have used is just this. Take a constant. That prime mark, didn't that mean derivative? Right? What is the derivative of a constant? Well, it's zero. The main difference between these two notations, <coughs> that I guess I should say, what makes this notation good is that it's clean. It's just c prime is zero. Here you have to add a little more. The advantage of this notation is that it specifies what your variable is. This does not. So sometimes this can be a little dangerous later on as we move on. We're going we're gonna to steer away from this a little bit because we need to be specific about the variable. You'll see. All right, good? So if I give you a constant, ask you what the derivative is, the answer is zero. Now, I'd like to show you this. I'd like to show you this real quick. It won't take long at all. That you could have shown this with the definition. Okay? So let's go back to that example. F, f of x equals 4. Right? Find f prime of x. All right. So what I would do is I'd write down f prime of x equals limit. h goes to 0. f of x plus h minus f of x, all over h, right? That's the definition of the derivative. But what is f of x plus h? What do you get when you plug x plus h into this function? What do you get? Four. four. It doesn't matter what you plug in this function, right? It always spits out four, no matter what. So the top left corner of this is what? Four minus what's f of x? Four, four as well, over h, right? And what's four minus four? 
zero. So you get limit, h goes to zero, and then on top you get zero, and on the bottom you get h. Now this is a, I was thinking about this, I was walking to my office this morning, I need to really make sure you understand this. This answer is zero. You are n this is not zero over zero. Remember we started this class and we were like, zero over zero is bad when you talk about a limit. This is not zero over zero. I know it looks like zero over zero because h is gonna go to zero, so that's gonna be zero down there, right? Yes? But the difference is, when I was saying zero over zero before, what I was saying is that the numerator was headed to zero and the denominator was headed to zero, right? That's what we meant before, zero over zero, top goes to zero, bottom goes to zero. Here, the numerator is zero. It's not headed to zero, it is zero. Four minus four is zero. It's not getting closer. It's exactly the number zero. And zero divided by any number should be zero, okay? Remember, h is getting smaller, right? But it's never gonna get to zero. So zero divided by any tiny number is still zero. All right, so that's how I can show it to you. It's like this is the proof that the derivative of a constant is zero visually. This is the proof that the derivative of a constant is zero algebraically with calculus with the limit. Understand? Yes? Okay. You ready for the second rule? So the second rule has to do with trying to find this. What is the derivative, treating x as the variable, of, okay, how about just x? Let's try it graphically. Let's see if we can visually do this one. So if I let f of x be equal to x, what's that? It's one. It's one, yeah. exactly. Let's see why. If you graph f of x equals x, what does it look like? <clears throat> yeah, it's the perfect diagonal line, isn't it? It's that, that diagonal that goes like this. We actually have a name for this. It's called the identity function. It's called the identity. It's called the identity because when, whatever you plug in is what comes out, right? You plug in two, it spits out two. You plug in three, it spits out three. Plug in negative four, it spits out negative four. Whatever goes in is identical to what comes out, right? So it's called the identity function. In algebra and pre-cal, you learn that this line is real, real important because when you're graphing a function, its inverse is a reflection over that identity. Remember, ever seen that? Like the reflection is the inverse? Okay. But for us, we want to know what is the derivative of this? So if you go to this line, right, and you look at any point on this line, what's the slope? One. Right? Does everyone agree the slope should be 1 anywhere I go? Right? And that's because rise over run, you could get that from that number right in front, right? That's your slope of your line. So that should be your slope all the time. So the derivative of x is 1. Done. Okay? The derivative of x is 1. Another way I could have written that. Is this? Okay. And there's one more thing I want you to see here that, again, will play a role later. I, in this notation, I'm saying, hey, take the derivative, right, with respect to x of x, right? That's what this means. But Algebraically, take that expression. You can kind of look at it like this is an x over 1 and slide this x up here. If I did that, I would say dx over dx, right? And that would be 1. Does that kind of make sense? Now, technically, that's not what's happening, but you can remember it this way if you look at it like that, okay? You'll see me later on in this class say, hey, you know, oh, we've got dx over dx. Well, that's one. Do you want me to show it to you? Do you want me to prove it with the limit or not? Yes. Yeah? You want to see it with the limit? It's not that bad. So look, all we have to do is replace this with x, right? This is still the same. This is what changes. All right, so what goes in the top left? What happens when you plug x plus h into that function? You get x plus h. 
and you subtract from that f of x. So what happens when you plug x in there? x, and then all of this divided by h. With me? What do you get? h over h, right? Limit, h goes to 0 of h over h, and the h's reduce out to be a 1, so this is just 1, which is what this says, right? We good? No questions? All, today, all you have to remember is this. The derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of x is 1. That's what you need to take away from this. But this is just me showing it to you as opposed to just giving you the, the formula and you just taking it on faith. All right, this one, I'm, I'm going to say this one does not have a name, okay? This one, because I'm about to give you the third one, and the third rule actually covers this as well. So the third rule, you can use the third rule to, to show this as well. So here's the next one. You ready? Third one. I would like to know, so far we know what the derivative of a constant is, right? Then x, right? Maybe we should do x squared next. Ooh, whoa, next. <coughs> should we, let me get some more of this drink here. Whoa. What is that called when you go reverse, you like age backwards? What is that called again? Hmm? Like that disease. It's a disease, right? Or it's, I don't know if it's real. Yeah, yeah. Going through puberty, yeah. <coughs> reverse. So x squared should be next, right? <laughs> that would make sense. And then x cubed after that and so on and so forth. That would take forever, right? So what we did instead is we said, what a, can we figure out what x, the derivative of x to the n is? Where n is any number, right? That seems like that's, that's a more uh, efficient way to go about this, right? In fact, if we can figure out what this is, then if you replace that with a 1, that's this, right? Right, this is x to the first power. So if we can find a formula for this, then we'll have all the powers of x covered. With me? Now, I can't graph this for you because it depends on what n is, right? If it's 1, it looks like something. If it's 2, it looks like something else. If it's 3, it looks like... So I can't draw you a graph. So I'm forced to use this, all right? So I'm going to start using it over here. So f prime of x, and remember, this is our function. Uh, let's just write it here. Just remember, f of x is x to some power n we don't know, right? I'm trying to figure out what the derivative of that is. So the definition is limit <coughs> h goes to 0. I'm not going to write this again, OK, because this should, you should already have this burned in, right? We need f of x plus h. So what is? What, is, what happens when you plug x plus h into that function? What does it look like? x plus h to the n, right? x plus h <coughs> to the nth power, all right? And then minus, over here, this is, you plug in x, right, into that, and you get x to the n. And then mi over, sorry, not minus, over h, right? That's where we are. <coughs> now, x plus h to the n. is not x to the n plus h to the n. That's not what that is. That's not the way our algebra works, right? Like if this was squared, you don't just square each one, you'd have to FOIL it, wouldn't you? If this was cubed, you don't cube each one, you'd have to do x plus h times x plus h times x plus h, right? So what is x plus h to the n? Well, do you remember when we did Pascal's triangle? And do you remember I told you to we would come back to this, come back to something there. It's in your notes if you wrote it down. <clears throat> Look, someone who has their notes, did I use x plus, x plus h or did I use x plus y? I did use x plus h? I th yeah, okay, I wanted to do that. So, would, so if you look at your notes where we did Pascal's triangle, I started out with, with x plus h to the zero and then x plus h to the first power and then we went down, and at the end, we got a formula for x plus h to the n. Okay? We did that because I knew today would come, all right? And now, what I'd like to know is what that was. So if you look in your notes, it was x to the n plus n 
x to the n minus 1 times h. And then if you look in your notes, I said plus, and then I, there was a number here, and I didn't know what it was, and I didn't care what it was, and I still don't care what it was, or, or what it is. And then what I have is x to the n minus 2h squared. Do you all have this in your notes? Yes? yes? Did, I go, did I do another one here? Did I do um, n minus 3h cubed or no? No. no? I said dot, 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 right? It's going to keep going. And then at the very end, there's an h to the n. Right? Yes. Okay. This is what x plus h to the n is, right? I'm going to take this and I'm going to stick that right here in the top left corner. It's going to look like it's, this is going to be horrible, but it's actually not going to be horrible. Limit h goes to 0. This is x to the n plus n times x to the n minus 1 times h plus some number in front of um, x to the n minus 2 times h squared plus a bunch of crap that I don't know, and at the very end, an h to the n. Right? That's the top left corner. That's all that is, the top left corner, right? What do I still need to do? Subtract x to the n, and then all of this over h, right? All right, do y'all see what cancels? x to the n, right? See that x to the n here, x to the n here. And now the big kind of thing we need to see. Every term in the numerator, every single term that's left in the numerator has at least one h in it, right? This one has an h. This next term has an h squared. The next one would have had h cubed to the fourth, to the fifth, until I get to the nth, right? So everything in there has at least one h, okay? So I'm gonna factor one h out. <clears throat> up the top. Here's where I am. Equals limit h goes to 0. Okay, when I pull the h out, I've got an h here. When I pull that h away from this, all I have is n x to the n minus 1 plus some number I don't know, right? Plus some number I don't know, x to the n minus 2 times what? Just h, right? Just h? Because I pulled, I pulled one of these h's away, right? Factored out. So now that h squared became h. Yes? And then I'm going to have plus, and then a bunch of stuff, right? And at the very end, h to what power? And minus 1. Good. One less than what it was, right? And then all of this over h, right? Now those h's cancel, yes? And what can you tell me about every single term over here? Not that one, but all of the terms in here. What can you tell me about all of them? They all go to zero because all of them have at least one h in them, right? This has an h, the next one has an h squared, the next one has an h cubed, the very last one has an h. So all of these have h's, right? And if I'm going to let h go to 0, then everything down here is going to vanish away to 0, which leaves us with what? That. And so our answer is nx to the n minus 1. And that is our formula. nx to the n minus 1. And this very, very important rule is called the power rule the power rule. And I cannot stress to you how powerful this rule is because now, in theory, we can take the derivative of x to any power. Any power. All right? Let's see it in action. All right? You want to see the rule in action? That's pretty cool, right? All right, so let's look at some examples. I want us to find the derivative, I'm going to use that notation, of x. Okay, we know the answer is what? 1. But let's use the power rule just to show that it works. If this is a 1 here, right, if that's a 1, then I'm using a 1 right there for this formula. 
So what happens here? Let's take a look at the formula in a little more depth so you can see kind of what's happening. This n that's here in the new formula is out front, isn't it? And then the power gets reduced by 1. So in a calculus class, what we normally say is, is when you take a derivative of x to a power, the power comes out front, 1, and then you rewrite x and then you subtract 1 from that power. What's 1 minus 1? Zero, right? So now we have 1x to the 0, but x to the 0 is what? 1. So this is 1 times 1, which is 1. So that coincides with what we already said, right? The derivative of x should be 1. All right, let's do another one. What about x squared? What's the derivative of x squared? So the power here is 2, right? So 2 comes out. x to the... 1, which is just 2x, two 2x. Two now, I just want to verify this, because we became some, we weren't, we didn't become experts, but um, let me see, if I graph x squared and I graph 2x, Think about what we learned last class, right? The red graph is the function, right? The blue graph is its derivative. So if I, asked you to, if, if I didn't give you the blue and asked you to graph the derivative of the red, you'd start here, the slope at the, the bottom of that zero, right? Slope down here is zero. So when you graph its derivative, at zero it should be zero, right? And then to the right of zero, my derivative is positive, right? But getting bigger. And then to the left of zero, my derivative is negative. So I know that my derivative is going to be over here like this and like that, right? That's what the blue line is. Got it? What about x cubed? What's the derivative? 3x squared. 3x squared. That's it. So if I graph x cubed and then I graph 3x squared, it's going to look like the function and its derivative are, are graphed together, okay? Is this just too easy now? x to the fifth? 5x to the fourth. Keep going. What's the derivative of x to the hundredth power? 100 x to the 99th power. That's it. See, we don't have to do any work. We don't have to set up a limit. We just use the rule. So far okay? I should have a question. Yes. Um, if there's a variable in front of the x, like we'll, we'll handle that. Square. We'll handle that. Yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm intentionally avoiding that. I will talk about one of the next rules. Yep, good question. Um, so how about this? I'm putting stars, because this is one you need to know. Like, you just need to memorize this one because it comes up so much. All right, what about the square root of x? What's the derivative of that? So what's the power? When I say square root, what's the power? One half. So you have to know that, right? That this really means x to the half, right? And I'm taking the derivative. Square root of x over x, is that the derivative? Yeah. Not quite. Close, but it's not quite. Yeah, okay, you're, you're, yeah. Just do the power rule though. What's the power rule say here? Bring the one half out, right? So bring the one half out, and then x, and what you're gonna do is take the half and subtract one, right? So when you do 1 half x, now this, taking a fraction, 1 half, and subtracting 1 is something, you need to get very, very quick in your mind of subtracting 1 from fractions. So the way we do this is you just get a common denominator, right? This 1 becomes a 2 over 2, so that the denominators match. And then you do 1 minus 2, that's negative 1, over the common denominator of 2. So this is negative 1 half, right? So this is negative 1 half power. That is the answer. I, this, I would say, yes, that is the derivative of the square root of x. But the way that I want you to remember it 
is by simplifying this a little bit more and getting it back to radical notation. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 half times, because that's a negative power, I'm going to move it to the bottom. I'm going to make a fraction out of it, make it a positive 1 half power. Right? Doesn't a negative power on a, on a variable mean we can drop it to the bottom? So I'm going to rewrite it this way. Is that all right? And what does x to the half really mean? Root x, root x right? So this is really 1 half times 1 over root x. And if I have two fractions being multiplied, I can just multiply across. So 1 times 1 is 1, and the bottom is 2 times the square root of x. And that is the way you should remember it. You do not need to rationalize it. From here on out, in this class, if I ask you what the derivative of the square root of x is, you should just go automatically to 1 over 2 root x. 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 All right? That's the derivative of the square root of x. Let's try another root. This is the one you need to remember. Other roots, they come up, but you don't need to memorize them. This one you need to memorize. Okay, how about the cube root of x? That's really x to what power? One third. Okay, try it. Bring the one third out. X to the, I take the one third, subtract one. Negative two thirds. So this is one third x to the negative two thirds. And you can leave it like that, or you can do the same thing we did here. Let me do the same thing we did here just so you can see it. This would be 1 third times 1 over x to the positive 2 thirds, right? And what's another way I can write this? This is a, this will, we'll see if y'all remember this from college algebra notation with radicals. If you have the nth root of x to the mth power, that is x to the m divided by n. That is a property of radicals and, well, we call this rational exponents. You have an exponent that's a rational number, a fraction, and then we call this radical notation. So radical notation, rational exponent notation. That's the connection between the two. So we're here right now, right? That's where we are? And we need to go back there. So I'm going to write one-third times one over, what root is it? Third. Cube root or third root. And then what goes inside? X squared. X squared. There you go. And you could multiply this together, put the ones together on top, and then three cube roots of X squared. That would be an appropriate answer. This is also appropriate. Okay, that's also okay. I would be fine with that on a test. Um, but this is also the same answer. All right. This one up here, the square root, I want you to remember this. Even though this is correct, I want you to remember it this way. It'll make your life so much easier later if you just remember this. Yes? Yeah, remember how we talked about higher order derivatives?